Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our keynote Thomas Ashton annual lecture. I can see that there are people still in the waiting room, so we're just going to wait a little longer to allow uh, people to come in and join us for the uh, presentation this afternoon, if we may. Okay, can I introduce myself to you? My name's Neil Bourne, and I'm a co-director from the of the Thomas Ashton Institute. My co-director, Andrew Curran, will be talking to you later, and you'll meet him uh, later on in the program. Could I have the next slide, please, Darren? Thank you. Uh, we're both delighted that Dame Judith has agreed to give this year's address, uh, and thanks to you for attending our virtual lecture. We're really sorry that circumstances conspired against us having a face-to-face -face lecture this year, but we hope to meet you further for future lectures um, in the in face to face in Manchester when we go forward. So, just some housekeeping there you can see on the slide. Uh, we ask that um, you put your questions and answers into the Zoom chat function. And at the end of that, we shall put those to Dame Judith uh, on your behalf at the end of the lecture. If those of you on YouTube can do the same, please, and use the YouTube comment section, we'd be very grateful. Uh, and obviously, there'll be a copy of the presentation on our website at the end of the event. So next slide, please, Darren. For those who don't know us, uh, our institute and this lecture are named after one of the contributors to the founding of the University of Manchester, Thomas Ashton. Um, underpinning his business acumen was his concern for the people that he employed. That also meant the structures in there in which they worked and their health and safety throughout their lives. These were precisely our intentions in founding an institute to tackle complex research questions in occupational safety and health. And we are engaged in that quest through risk and regulatory research, as you'll be able to see from this slide and from our web resources that you're very welcome to look at going forward. So without further ado, a little background on our speaker. Dame Judith is a chemical engineer by training and she is the chair and board member of a whole range of organizations, including Make UK, Ingenuity, and a director of the high value manufacturing catapult in advanced manufacturing that many of you be familiar with. She's also a board member of HS2 Limited. She now chairs the industry safety steering group, which is key in setting up one of the new building safety regulator functions that resulted from an independent review into building regulations and fire safety in high rise building. This has led to the Building Safety Act, which uh, got royal assent just over a week ago. And so now is in law and ready for us to uh, move forward into a, a safer built environment for UK, we hope. I know Dame Judith is passionate about the need for industry to step up its responsibilities for safety and quality. And so it's my pleasure to invite you to give the 2022 Ashton Lecture, Removing the Blinkers, Why It's So Difficult. Dame Judith. Neil, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, try and use the technology now and share my screen uh, and hopefully uh, we will be uh, you will be able to uh, follow the uh, the process with 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 my slides so we've got those up on slideshow yeah they're coming through now great okay and that's on slideshow yes thank you um well, as, as I say, good afternoon. I'm I'm delighted to have this opportunity to to deliver this this lecture this afternoon. It's an honour for me. Hey, uh, I, I don't I don't think that's showing on slideshow in my screen. I try again. 
How is that? We're one. Uh, yeah. So there we go. There we are. So thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to follow David Snowball, who delivered the inaugural lecture uh, of this series for the Thomas Aston Institute last year. And having recently read David's inaugural lecture, there is, I think, a logical follow on from his regulatory theme last year to mine and my theme, which, as you know, is about taking the blinkers off and trying to examine what gets in the way of us seeing the bigger picture and why sometimes learning can be quite difficult. I'm really pleased, having had a quick glance at the attendee list this afternoon, to see such a wide variety of attendees here today from different sectors. And I think as I get into my presentation, you will start to see why that is important. So let's get going. In 2013, July, when I was chair of the Health and Safety Executive. Back then, I spoke at one of the most memorable conferences I think I've ever participated in. The event was held in Aberdeen to mark the 25th anniversary of Piper Alpha. 25 years on from that terrible disaster that cost the lives of 167 people, the level of emotion in that conference hall of 700, several hundred people was palpable. We heard that day from those who were on the rig, but who were lucky enough to escape. Believe me though, they did not feel lucky. 25 years later, they were still haunted by what had happened that night and dealing with their feelings of guilt that they had survived when their workmates had perished. I start this lecture by referring to that event in 2013 for two reasons. One, I will return later to the tragedy itself and the parallels with the Grenfell Tower fire in 2017. But secondly, because at that conference in Aberdeen, I said in a speech for the very first time, I think, but most definitely not the last, that there are no new accidents, just different people making the same mistakes because of a failure to learn. Over almost a decade now, I've repeated that and also been frequently quoted for having said it. I still believe that to be true today, but I think with the benefit of what I've learned in recent years, I would modify those words to say, there are no new accidents, just different people making the same mistakes because of a failure to recognize the relevance to them of other people's experience and therefore not learning. I want to talk now about my own personal journey. And I know that this will be different for many people, but it, I think this is important for me to share with you because it, it influences the way I think and the way that I have done many of the things that I've done in my career. Much of the detail of what I've learned, I've since forgotten. But many of the lessons I've learned about safety have stayed with me. My first lesson came when I was still a young student of chemical engineering back in June 74, the explosion at Flixborough. That was when I first learned that the career path I'd chosen whilst being full of opportunity and excitement, was also a dangerous profession in some respects, and one where I needed to be aware of the responsibility that I was taking on. I was going to enter an industry where in the course of providing huge benefit to society from the products of the industry, we also had a moral obligation to operate responsibly, 
and to protect our own employees and the public at large from harm as a result of those operations. Just over a year later, when I graduated, I started my working career with Exxon at Forley. And the importance of safety was made clear to each and every one of us from day one. Safety truly was a core value and the rigor we applied to both personnel and process safety was embedded as part of standard practice. Even in those distant days in the 1970s, when negotiations with trade unions were commonplace and took place on most days of the week, our efforts to remove what were considered to be artificial and unnecessary lines of demarcation, our commitment to safety was still very evident. We pushed for what we call TAS. Anyone with the time, the ability, but only in circumstances where they could do it safely to be able to perform routine maintenance tasks. In the late 1970s and the early 80s, the shadow of Flixborough was still very much apparent across the whole of the chemical industry, irrespective of whether you worked for ICI, BP, Shell, Exxon, or anyone else. The importance of design standards, thorough review, management of change, maintaining accurate records, peer review, and much more were part of the fabric of how we worked. It remains that way today, of course, but it has also evolved significantly, driven by learning lessons from incidents, by the emphasis on safety from professional bodies like iChemE, and also, of course, driven by new and tougher regulatory standards. In the mid-1980s, I first became familiar with the principles of the safety case with the introduction of what were then the CEMA regulations in 1984. My strongest recollection of that time though was not about the rigorous assessment of what could go wrong or how we mitigated the risks or what our emergency plans were. We already had much of that in place, which we reviewed, we added to, and we built upon it. The big change, however, was associated with the need to assess impact beyond the boundary fence for our neighbours and a statutory duty to inform them. The regulations required for the first time that we formally engage with our neighbours outside of the fence who could potentially be impacted by a major incident. We installed new hardware public alarm systems, we generated information packs to explain the actions that residents would need to take in an emergency if the alarm sounded. I can't underplay how daunting that felt back then to many of us as engineers. The prospect of knocking on doors and explaining in lay people's terms what we were doing behind the fence what the potential risks were to them, and generally being much more transparent about what we did and why. We also knew then that we had to listen and we had to respond to their concerns that we were sure there would be, and that we needed to be respectful. We were worried that the information we were sharing might raise their levels of anxiety. If we tell them what might happen, they're going to worry. They might want to move away, that they would see the site as a blight on the neighborhood and on the value of their properties. The reality turned out to be quite different, in fact. Our openness and our transparency was welcomed for the most part. Knowing was considered to be far better than wondering about that mysterious site next door and having a plan was actually reassuring to them. This was my first lesson in resident engagement and something I did not know I was going to call upon again 
in other ways later in my career. I know that for many companies, the rigors of preparing SEMA regulations and then subsequently the move to coma by compiling everything that went into that safety case was a huge challenge. There were concerns, not just about opening up to neighbors, but also about how the regulator would apply new standards retrospectively to installations which had been designed to different standards. But the introduction of this regulatory framework, which is outcomes based and is clear about the duty holders role and responsibilities versus those of the regulator has with the benefit of now more than 30 years in operation turned out to work extremely well. Performance has improved. Levels of confidence in major hazards industries has increased. It has driven culture change across the whole industry sector and beyond, both geographically and into some other sectors. But as I will say, talk about later in this presentation, not yet all. That's not to say, of course, that incidents have stopped. Significant lessons have still had to be learned from events like Bunsfield, Bhopal, Texas City, and Deepwater Horizon. Some of what we did learn was the need for industry leadership, the right culture, and never to be complacent, but to maintain that state of constant unease. Continuing my personal journey, by the time I left frontline manufacturing and joined the Chemical Industries Association, public concern had shifted. This was partly, of course, as a result of the industry's much improved operational performance but also because of, an of the industry's commitment to a voluntary program that was called Responsible Care. This was and still is a global voluntary program which encourages the sharing of good practice, knowledge sharing, and commits the industry to continuous improvement. But by the millennium, concerns were being expressed about a different issue from operational safety. It was about the environmental impact and the fate of the products of the chemical industry. And the industry was found to be not prepared or yet ready to respond to these new concerns. Despite the introduction several years earlier of strict legislation, which required all new substances to be thoroughly tested before being brought to market, industry had failed to honor its commitment to test all existing substances which were already on the market and in many and various uses. It is largely because of this failure to act that we now have reach regulations. The mammoth task that many are now involved in in pooling data filling in the gaps and understanding the environmental fate of all existing substances is now being driven by regulation with the added challenges of implementing that here in the UK following our departure from the EU. Industry knew there was a problem, but it didn't act quickly enough and so came regulation to drive that change. But also at that time, in the early 2000s, some of the behaviours shown by industry did not evidence some of those other lessons, which I've already referred to, which could have been learned from their own past. Concerns about potential health damage, long term genetic implications and biodiversity damage were met with initially by the industry with reassurance that safety was very important. Proof was offered in the form of really low loss time accident frequency rates on chemical sites. The public interpretation initially was that industry 
simply wasn't listening. And we, we had and the journey to acknowledge that we didn't have the answers and needed to respond differently took time. And we had to learn some of those lessons all over again. But having said all of this, when I look at the major hazards industries today and those who work in it, I am impressed by the journey and the progress that has been made. Although there will always be exceptions, of course, I see an industry which understands that it has a moral and an ethical responsibility to deliver the benefits of its products and also to take full responsibility for safety and environmental impacts. It is often referred to as its license to operate. I also see processes and mechanisms in place in professional bodies and in education to ensure that lessons of the past continue to be learned and shared. New tools and approaches are being developed in process safety because of a strong sense that this journey has no end and requires a constant sense of unease, never job done, no room for complacency. Acknowledgement of the significant progress made still leaves the door open to do better. This is, as I said, a never ending journey. And in the major hazards industries, mistakes do still continue to repeat themselves. When I became president of the Institution of Chemical Engineers in 2013, I use the long history of ammonium nitrate explosions which have occurred around the world over more than a hundred years to demonstrate my concerns about not learning from the past. I did that because a matter of weeks before my presidential speech, yet another ammonium nitrate explosion had occurred and claimed more lives in West Texas. The pattern of ammonium nitrate incidents is that they are very big and they claim large numbers of lives. They are massive explosions, but they happen many years apart, often decades apart. And one reason why we fail to learn is related to that passage of time. The shock of what actually occurred and much of the detail gets lost. I've spoken already about Flixborough, Piper Alpha and Bhopal, but all of those tragedies happened more than 30 years ago. For those of us around at the time, and especially those close to the industry involved in those events, it made an indelible impression on us and it has changed how we approach our work. We've embedded it in formal practices and we know why we do what we do, because we remember. But is the importance of following those practices truly instilled in those who came later? They may know what they have to do, but do they know why it is so important? I suspect that in all cases, they may not. The way we tell the stories of the past and what we remember often focuses on what happened, not why it happened. We also tend to fix the what's rather than the why's because it's easier to do and to measure. Installing hardware to prevent storage tanks overflowing or wells blowing out is much easier and more tangible than addressing failures of organizations and of management. My friend Andrew Hopkins, not an engineer by discipline, has provided us with a wealth of insight into why the human and organizational side of learning lessons is so important. We need to remember that, we need to learn it, and we need to share it. 
I've thought about the what and the why a lot in the last five years. When I was asked to conduct the independent review into building regulations and fire safety in 2017, after the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower, I jumped at the chance. I had been as shocked as anyone by what we saw that night. It reminded me at the time of Piper Alpha and the haunting images of people fleeing for their lives. More similarities were to emerge, of course, and I still believe that for the built environment sector, Grenfell Tower will turn out to be the, their equivalent of Piper Alpha for the offshore industry in terms of marking the point at which the culture had to change. I was keen to play a part in understanding what had happened and why. To what extent was the discovery of, of any other buildings of concern over a matter of weeks evidence of real regulatory failure, which was the question I was asked, or was it something else? My focus was on understanding and on getting to root cause. My first surprise in those first few weeks was how many people I spoke to already claimed to know with a great deal of conviction, the cause of the tragedy. Austerity and cuts to local government was one example of the reason that was offered to me by many people I spoke to. They had jumped to conclusions based on their own prejudices or because of what they'd read or heard. With some, the conviction was strong enough that they really did not feel there was any need for detailed and protracted investigation. The reason was obvious. The biggest assumption I encountered, however, was that this is all about cladding. No one would argue then or now that cladding was not a significant issue in the tragedy. But the concern is about the underlying need that that portrays for a quick answer and one that can be fixed by something as simple as a ban. For me, this is an example of a societal problem which hinders our ability to learn and in some cases even to get to the true root cause of what has actually happened, let alone learn the lessons. Finding someone or something to blame takes precedence over taking the time to understand complexity. Why people did what they did, what pressures they were under, what were the systemic issues? These are the questions that will lead to solutions and lessons learned that will put long-term sustainable answers in place. My Building a Safer Future report is now a matter of record. It is about systemic change to the whole system to drive very different behaviours. The majority of recommendations, as you've heard, have now become law in the Building Safety Act, which received royal assent only two weeks ago. But my recommendations were not just about regulatory reform. They were about the need for a whole industry sector to change its culture and to go on a journey. My questions in the early days of my work were based on my own experience. I asked who is responsible for the design of the building? Who ensures that what is designed is what gets built? Who decides a building is safe for occupation? Who manages safety during the building's operational phase when it's in operation? To a chemical engineer and to any chemical engineer on this call, they're pretty basic and pretty obvious questions. But the answers surprised me. They were vague and it soon became clear that there was no real sense of responsibility or ownership. And the regulatory system, though complex, 
did not drive the right behaviours. No one felt responsible for overall outcomes and pointed to others as maybe being the people who were to be who were responsible or more commonly to blame. Regulators and policymakers themselves had fallen into the trap of trying to counter bad practice by writing ever more prescriptive guidance, fixing the what, not the why, and assuming responsibility for a problem which was not theirs to fix and which could not be fixed without getting to root cause and clarifying those responsibilities and stopping the bad practices that had become endemic. But what I've also reflected on a lot in the last five years is how did this happen in the sense of how did this sector, the built environment, remain immune to the culture change and the learning processes which were already going on in other sectors like chemicals, oil and gas, nuclear, rail and aviation. And for me, to a large extent, this is about being able to dismiss things that happen in other sectors as not being relevant because we haven't distilled out the parts which are relevant. One of the lesser well publicized pieces of work, which was taking place at the same time as I was doing my review, was Peter Hansford's excellent report in plain sight. Peter and his colleagues at the Institution of Civil Engineers carried out an honest assessment of how the profession identified and managed catastrophic risk in civil engineering projects of all sizes, from residential development to large infrastructure projects. Their view was that the sector was at some risk of being complacent about its big risks those which were hidden in plain sight, hence the title of the report. They concluded that there was a real need for more systematic risk assessment and management with many similarities in their recommendations to the safety case type approach developed and now in common use in other sectors. I remain perplexed as to how we can continue to have to keep learning these same lessons over and over again in different sectors because of our unwillingness or perhaps our inability to see the relevance and value of a hard lesson learned elsewhere. This is one reason why some three years ago, I agreed to chair the Royal Academy of Engineering and Lloyd's Register Foundation's work on safer complex systems. The reality of our world today is that the level of complexity and interdependence between systems is increasing all of the time. The tools and techniques, good though they are, that we have developed and used to date, have for the most part been developed in disciplinary silos. Not only do we need to do much, much more to share knowledge and to do so in ways that have relevance, emphasizing the whys and not the whats, but we also need to develop new ways of assessing interconnected and interdisciplinary complex systems, which are becoming more and more part of the world in which we live in. Next week, the Safer Complex Systems team will be launching a series of case studies which cover a wide variety of disciplines and have happened in all parts of the world. Their purpose is to educate, to stimulate debate and learning. They are about humanitarian crises in far-flung parts of the world caused by floods or fires and years of drought. And whilst they may seem irrelevant to rail system safety, for example, or high rise buildings in London, 
there is valuable learning to be shared. We fail to learn when we take a narrow view, when we try to find a simple solution or a short-term short fix to a complex problem. When we convince ourselves that what happened to them couldn't happen to us. When we quickly look to blame others rather than being honest about our own role and our own responsibility. When we fail to listen to that one voice in the room who says, we shouldn't be doing this. And when responsibility gets blurred and people assume that it's others' jobs, not theirs. I'm not suggesting by any means that it is easy to uphold the moral and ethical high ground. But isn't that our prime responsibility as engineers and as leaders? One organization which I am involved with today has a core values system which contains these four simple but very deep values. Safety, leadership, respect and integrity. I personally feel passionate about all of those core values, but I'm absolutely certain that integrity is the key to everything. For me, that's about where leadership will inevitably be lacking and where safety will not be real. Integrity is about honesty. It's about humility, about taking responsibility and most definitely about being willing to learn. We must find ways to aid learning within sectors and between sectors, beyond engineering disciplines and into social sciences. I'm quite sure that you won't have agreed with everything that I've said in the course of this lecture, and that I have probably generated as many questions as I have given you answers but that for me is a very good way to start the debate because by raising those questions, we will be kicking off the learning process. So thank you for your attention. I do hope that I have stimulated some thoughts and some of the things that I've said have resonated with some of the audience at some point. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Dame Judith, thank you very much indeed for a really insightful and clear lecture. And we're very grateful that the 2022 invited Thomas Ashton lecture uh, has been delivered by yourself, because those insights are exactly the kinds of uh, things that we have a great interest in uh, in the Thomas Ashton Institute. I think, uh, as you mentioned, it's very timely given the Royal Assent given to the Building Safety uh, Bill last uh, in the last couple of weeks. But I think you've also demonstrated that it's wider than just building safety. There's a huge issue here in relation to how we do learn and perhaps more importantly, how we share that learning across uh, the sectors that are dealing with potentially high hazard areas. And again, uh, as you mentioned, it's really great to see so many sectors represented, not just on the uh, Zoom, call or Zoom call, but also on the YouTube channel. And that, as you've suggested at the end there, hopefully is the start of that cross-sector learning process. I think the other point that you made that I would absolutely agree with is, is the need to have better tools and approaches to understand the complexity of some of the systems that are involved here and bringing to bear on that work the right mix of disciplines because um, we can sometimes end up looking at a problem not just with the same sector eyes but also with the same discipline eyes and I think getting some new insights from both the sector and the discipline perspective becomes really important when getting to grips with these really difficult uh, relationships and interfaces that occur within the context of those systems so really really grateful that you've raised that question 
I'm also really pleased that we've got a lot of questions appearing in the chat. So without further ado, I'm going to start that discussion that you invited um, with our first question, um, which is from Tom Osorio. Uh, and he suggests that there's a common theme identified by Andrew Hopkins analysis, uh, and that is regulatory failure. Um, and the examples that he gives are the Cullen uh, report for Piper Alpha and the 737 MAX tragedies. And the specific question is, how do you suggest that UK regulators improve their culture of learning long term from major incidents internationally and across sectors? Thank you. OK, good question. I, I, I think that the, um, the point about learning applies just as much to regulators as it does to um, to industry itself. Uh, that's the first thing to say. Um, I, I, and again, I think we have seen uh, lessons that have been learned and which some of us thought had been well embedded uh, get challenged. Uh, and, and sometimes we take a step backwards with regulation, I think. Um, all of that said, I think regulatory forums across, across the globe are really important. Um, but in terms of the fundamental of what makes for good regulation, I'm in absolutely no doubt that it's about outcomes. It's about regulating what needs to be achieved. It's not about telling people what they have to do, because the minute you get into that prescriptive mode, then you are taking away responsibility from the people who, A, know, and B, should be taking responsibility for making decisions by, by them simply ticking boxes and saying, I did what you told me. Thank you. And I guess that, that's quite a delicate balance, isn't it, between that uh, need for people to take ownership and accountability for the risks that they're generating and the requirement for the regulators to have some kind of boundary conditions on which that relationship is founded. So do you think we've got that right? Do you think there are things that we need to do differently to make sure that that balance is, is kept in check? Um, I, I guess one of my watchwords, Andrew, is, is there's always room for improvement. And if anybody can think of a better way, I'm always open to it. But I personally think that the um, the HSE's approach to um, production of guidance and codes of practice is a very good example of how to get that balance right. You give people guidance on what they might do. You also give them it through codes of practice evidence of if, if you do it like this, then that will achieve compliance. But you don't say you have to do it this way. So you leave room for people to think for themselves, to think of better ways, because as I say, it is all about continuous improvement in my view. And, um, and, and for me, that, that, that's, that's a pretty good model to work from. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll pass over to Neil for the next questions. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew, and thank you so much for that uh, that incredible lecture. Uh, really thought provoking. Um, from my side, I was particularly interested in your comments on the ammonium nitrate factories and the explosion issues that have happened within the processing of that material. There, I know explosives incidents go back to when the Bell patented this stuff in the first place. Um, and there have been some big recent disasters. Um, Tanjin in 2015 took out a, a whole port and killed nameless people. And then Beirut in 2020 again. Yep. Now, I know those weren't processing issues, but do you think there's some underlying research issues as well that need to be addressed to solve programs like the ammonium nitrate issue? Uh Without a doubt, I think that's true. Um, what is the nature of those research issues is, is, is a slightly different question. I, I think um, I, would, I would go back to what I said earlier, which is about it would be good for that research to focus on why does this keep happening? Because I don't think we're going to find out anything new about the nature of ammonium nitrate. What I think we have to research 
is how do people keep falling into this trap of thinking it's okay to store thousands and thousands of tons of it and not not make taking the right precautions with stuff that self-evidently has taken countless numbers of lives over the years how does that complacency creep in is it because it's simply a fertilizer that's used by the agriculture i don't know we need to understand the why as well as the what i think that's such a good point and the tacit 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 acceptance of the industry to the fact that these explosions have somehow become normalized is is something that's really worrying in yeah. behaviors that one sees in in industry sometimes so with that let me let me pass on to to a question from the from the audience um this one talks about shared building ducting with no fire breaks that's found in um, some recent work in Manchester recently, where they only found by luck um, that there was um, shared ducts um, affecting the, the ventilation from the building um, when the emergency services were alerted. Do you think that the outsourcing of fire safety affects local knowledge feedback? which has been engaged during building work, and that should have stopped issues like this happening in the first place? Short answer is no. I don't think it's the outsourcing that's, pro that's the problem. And, and again, I think, you know, that's no different to me from, from questions that I've been involved in in various roles over the years about has contractorization in the chemical industry, in the rail industry, led to some of the problems it's not the act of passing on the work. It's the act of passing on the responsibility and failing to retain that accountability for ensuring that the job is done properly. That's the failure. So, so let, let's, let's be clear that, that outsourcing in itself is not a problem, provided you put the right means in place to manage that and the person who is doing that feels responsible for ensuring that the work is done to the right quality. Okay, that's a, a really good answer, and, and obviously takes into the fact now that uh, that there's a big emphasis in the in the new building um, safety guidance about the the golden thread connecting the information so that it follows down the train. Excellent. Absolutely. And, and I think just, Neil, just to pick up on that point, I think um, <laughs> it's another example of, of um, failure to learn or failure to pick up good practice. I don't know of any other sector or anything that any one of us buys or uses in our lives other than our houses that we don't know enough about. We cannot trace what was used when or where whether it's the car that's sitting outside or the washing machine, every element of that is traceable. How is it that we have all collectively allowed one industry to sit on its hands and not embrace that need for traceability and proper stewardship of what has gone into the biggest investment that most of us will ever make in our lives? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a really forthright point and hopefully one that uh, will be something that will be taken on with the new legislation that's in place now to, to take things forward. Andrew. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to pick up on a couple from the live stream channel and just roll them together, if I may. So, Judith, the question is about uh, whether you still think that the chemical sector is a model for other sectors in the way in which it manages major accident hazards and in that context how do you think it could teach some of the old dogs that you've mentioned in inverted commas to learn some new tricks as a consequence if i said the chemical industry was was a model um I, I said I was impressed by the journey that they've made i don't think it was perfect by any means and i gave some examples of where they themselves were blinkered about things when new problems arose that they could have seen coming. Um, so 
by no means do I think they've been perfect, but I think they've got a lot to offer in terms of learning on that journey, both in terms of the progress they've made, but also quite probably some of the mistakes they've made along the way that others don't need to learn for themselves. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really important point. And I'm, I'm going to pick up on that, if I may, on a, on a question that Nick Shaw's asked uh, on, on this sort of uh, reason behind the failure to learn lessons. And Nick suggests that uh, it might perhaps be due to deeper systemic and societal factors rooted in the nature of the relationship between those responsible for the hazards and those exposed to them and suggests that if duty holders have a deeply held belief that first and foremost, their responsibility is to protect people and the environment, do you think they would be more motivated to act with the interests of those who may be harmed first and foremost in their minds? Without a doubt, I, I, th I, I, think, um, I think there is a, a, a real truism in all of that. One of the things that uh, I failed to mention, because I could have gone on for hours and hours and hours on this, on this subject, is, is that it's interesting, I think, to reflect on the fact that the journey that I've discussed in my career has uh, tracked pretty closely with the period where shareholder value was king. Uh, I think we are uh, going through a radical change in our thinking right now on uh, ESG matters to one where it's stakeholder value and participation that matters uh, and that that uh, I think shifts that balance to a much stronger drive to behave responsibility responsibly in relation to the whole community and I think you start to see that in the way engineers talk about themselves now we no longer talk about you know it's all about maths and being good at physics and stuff. We actually talk about having a role in delivering solutions for society. And we should be proud about that. That is what we do. And we should have people in the industry who are proud to do that and want to do that. Not simply to, you know, because they're good at maths and look at their shoes. That's not what we want. Absolutely. I think, you know, that that, that change in culture and attitude clearly needs to start the beginning of uh, a young engineer's career. So do you think the, the universities, the professional societies are doing enough to support that ambition and shift that culture uh, and get it facing towards the societal challenges, um, perhaps as much as they could do? Uh, I think they're moving in the right direction. I think the pace is too slow. And there again, I think it's too siloed. Um, I, I genuinely, and if there's any academics on the line, I apologise in advance about what I'm going to say because it's controversial, but I genuinely question why we are channeling people into strict disciplines at the age of 18 rather than attracting them into engineering and getting them to see the commonality across the whole of the, of, of the discipline and allowing them to specialise later, recognising that even if they their first job is as a chemical engineer, they may, be, they may move into civil engineering or whatever. We operate in a multidisciplinary world out there in industry, and yet we train them in silos. It can't be right. Excellent. And, and on that note, I'll hand to my academic colleague, Neil, to uh, ask <laughs> the, the next question. Thanks, Neil. No, and, and, and I think that's something that, uh, that we within the Ashton Institute really take on board because we have created something that is intentionally not only interdisciplinary, but it's trying to produce solutions which are transdisciplinary in nature, where they, they, they wouldn't be thought about from any of the individuals involved in the process of getting to that answer. And that's really something that's deep in the philosophy of the way Ashton's been created. And I hope that we can follow um, that example in several of the other the university activities going forward. But at the risk of losing my job, if, if anybody uh, in my uh, management chain is on board here, there's uh, some interesting um, views uh, on the chat, one from a psychologist in HSE, um, 
And he is also echoing one of the points that, that you made, um, where whilst most would say, he points out, safety is a priority, um, that's often contradicted by their lack of resource or the lack of investment or the lack of competencies that they found uh, around them at the coalface. Do you have any suggestions, he asks, on how we might close the gap between saying the right thing and taking meaningful action? Well, I, I don't. I don't want to. At the risk of sounding trite, something I said a lot when I was chair of HSE to many of the companies that I engaged with in all sectors was anyone who said to me safety is a number one priority, and I said that's not good enough. It has to be a core value, not a priority. It's not about that's the most important thing we do because it isn't it isn't that's not what you're in business to do you are in business to do something else and that's your priority but the way in which you go about it is about a core value and that's why i i ended with what i said about core values about how you do things not just what you do yeah, and I think that's really important. And I, and I noticed there's a question from Kate Field on our live stream here, um, where, you know, additionally, do you think that the complexity of the built environment and the economic diversity there will hamper change if we don't have these core values underpinning what we do? Yes, I do. And, but I think what is extraordinary about the, the built environment sector in particular is the extent to which it is complex, I would say fragmented, and a lot of that is self-imposed. So it could be made a lot simpler and a lot easier if, if the sector were prepared to embrace more cultural change and more structural change, I think. Okay, Andrew. Thanks, Neil. Uh, one, of the, one of the points you made throughout your, your presentation, Judith, was the issue of leadership. And uh, we've already heard uh, about the, uh, you know, uh, saying the right thing versus meaningful actions kind of approach. But leadership isn't just at the top of organisation, it's often throughout an organisation. And somebody's asked a question about uh, the supervision aspects of leadership in the construction industry, and whether there should be more supervision from competent supervisors, uh, and whether that um, supervision should in itself be subject to independent oversight. Uh I think that the short answer to that is yes, there is, there, there is not enough supervision and there is certainly not enough supervision at a time when we all have serious concerns about the level of competence of the people who need to be supervised. The greater the levels of competence, the more you can back off on close supervision. But when you've got concerns about the level of competence, there can be no question that you need but that you need more supervision. And then there's, there's a sort of a, a, an associated question, which is around the whole process of selection for leaders. Um, and, you know, you've clearly identified this shift um, in the, the needs that we have from our, from our leaders going forward. But has that been mirrored in the selection processes and the key criteria that are often advertised for those posts um, so that we can be sure that we're selecting the people that have the right skills, which may be different from those traditional skills, to provide the leadership that's needed today rather than the leadership that was um, provided uh, yesterday? Um, well, that, that, that's, that's another journey that we're all on for sure. Um, again, I, I, I think there's big change going on. Um, I can't give you a simple answer to has the whole system shifted? I think you, there are many, many examples of where it is shifting. The process of recruitment um, is, is, is changing in lots of different ways. And the drive for equality and diversity and inclusion is I think moving us absolutely in the right direction there in terms of encouraging us all to get out of this 
kind of hamster wheel of recruiting in our own image and moving to a system of, of embracing and recognizing the business value of not just diversity of gender and race and so on, but diversity of thinking. I think that's a really, really important point. And, you know, I think, as you say, it's often lost um, actually having a diversity of people that you can draw on to change the way that an organization thinks, I think is absolutely critical for yes. you know, innovation and changing the direction in a positive way, because without that diversity of thought, you just won't get the, those innovations coming through. So that's a really, really important point. Uh, Neil, back to you. Yes, thanks, Andrew. And um, thinking about the organizations who could actually uh, assist with perhaps the processes that could make these things happen, Eric Marsden's put in a, a comment wondering which organizations could undertake proactive multi-risk, multi-sector analyses of system level safety problems. Um, is that HSE with an expanded mandate? Uh, engineering professional bodies, multi-sector accident investigation boards, or, or, or maybe you, you have other suggestions of, of, of how you might make that happen. I think, it, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's about structure, though. I think it's, first of all, about recogn recognising the need to do it recognizing the need to pull those multidisciplinary teams together. I don't think it has to be led by a regulator or a professional body, just in the same way that uh, if I go back to my chemical days, the stuff that I know, um, you know, when we first did what Trevor Kletz told us to do and did has ops and has ands, we brought a team of people together to do that from many different parts of the organization. It's, it's an extension of that, in my view, that when you're looking at a complex interdisciplinary, interdependent system, you need to get the right people in the room. And I don't think that's about giving the job to a regulator or a professional body. It's about recognizing the need to get the right people in the room. Yeah, that's absolutely obviously the case, and one that quite often doesn't happen um, in these fragmented organizations. Um, it's interesting, so you see the solutions really being bottom-up rather than top-down to, to make these changes happen. Andrew? By and large, yes, but, but as I said, I think, I think that will be helped by tools that we need to develop. And, and I don't think the tools that we have today are necessarily good enough for the complexity of the issues we're now having to deal with. Sure, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Neil. Uh, still lots more questions coming, Judith. You've obviously stimulated the discussion that you're looking for, which is fantastic. So um, the next question is about the, the comments that you made that the, the focus on the what is far more widespread than on the why. And therefore, in your experience, for those companies that have focused more on the whys, what strategies have they used to foster that culture? Above all else, I think it's honesty and humility, being able to admit failure and you can't learn from organizational or human failure unless you're prepared to admit you got it wrong. And it's only when you do that that you can say, so, so what's going to change? Um, and, and that, I think, is, is the corollary of that is that's why we focus on the what, because, you know, we specified the wrong valve is easy. We can fix that. Um, we made the wrong decisions or, you know, our culture was inappropriate is a much harder problem to fix. But it's that humility and that ability to recognize when failure has occurred that, that matters most. Absolutely. I think that there's a follow on question, perhaps, that I'll pick up uh, in the chat as well, which is perhaps, therefore, where we have that goal based regulatory, regulatory regime and the responsibilities on the operator. 
it clearly can enable that kind of conversation. But what the questioner is suggesting here that in the oil and gas industries, uh, the SECE uh, verification schemes, for example, um, uh, have potentially degraded some of that thinking to a tick box going through the most ineffective exercise. Yeah. Any, any yeah. views or comments on that? Yeah, yes, I think, I, again, you know, not all of the, not, I, I, I don't want to put any one industry on a pedestal here. If you pulled all of the good practice from all sectors, we could all move a long way forward. And, and in this space, I think everyone always looks at aviation because for sure their ability to share lessons learned and mistakes and to do so in a way that doesn't um, apportion blame or put point fingers, but is actually just about, we want everyone to know about this and learn from it. We could all do a lot better if we did more of what they do in aviation or found a way to do that in a way that is relevant in whatever sector. And interestingly, the next question is actually about the aviation sector. So the, the, the questioner, uh, Richard Roth, is saying that whilst the av aviation sector is not without issue, um, it has, as you say, over many decades, accepted that the reporting of incidents based on investigation by organisations that are, in principle anyway, independent from the regulators is, is the way they do things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Richard suggests that whilst that's not true of the coma industries, do you think that independence of investigator would help the built environment sector to open up and move it forward more quickly? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. And, and I think, you know, again, um, one of the sadnesses for me um, in in the industry that I was part of for so many years was 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 the this disbanding of the chemical safety board because that is a perfect example of an independent organization that I think did so much to help learning across the chemical industry. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed, Judith. And I'll pass back to Neil. Thanks, Neil. Thanks so much, Judith. I mean, there's one last point that I think is coming out that I'm hearing from a lot of the discussions that are going on. And I think we are going to have to, perhaps after this one, draw this to a conclusion. We, we can't have you sitting there grilled like this <laughs> by the masses. So I'm very sorry to everybody. We're not going to be able to, uh, to get all the points across, but that this conversation can continue over the years. So perhaps I, I could put this to you and, 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 and start a little debate about this. Um, Josh Arnold um, asks, do you recommend any effective tools or approaches to investigation that we can promote um, as a, an interesting cadre of people in the, in the field here to ensure that correct lessons are learned from accidents that have happened? Um, I think if, if I could sum that up very quickly, it would be make sure you get to the why. Because until you've, you've gotten into the real root causes, you aren't A, going to fix the problem, and you aren't going to be mining the depth of learning that is there for everyone else too. And, and all too often, even today, lots of the investigations that I see are still very much about what happened and how do we fix the what, not understanding what it is organisationally or structurally or whatever else has caused this to happen. Okay, I, I think that's absolutely the case and, and really one that we should try and take back. Uh, and, and obviously within the Institute, we're interested in addressing that why question. Um, and it is really our, our um, bread and butter to consider those questions going forward. So really, thank you so much, Dame Judith, for your erudite and thought provoking lecture. Uh, I'm sure we're all going to be continuing this conversation in our heads and thinking on this point after the lecture closes. Um, thank you to the audience so much for registering and attending this discussion today, but we'd love to continue this conversation. And so I do hope you'll stay in touch with the Institute and continue the debate with us as we go forward 
Um, so I hope you're going to allow us to stay in contact with you. And if any of you have problems with not allowing your uh, connections to be uh, put into our, our mailing going forward, do please uh, let us know. Otherwise, thank you again, Dame Judith. Thank you to the audience. And do have a very good evening and think carefully uh, about all that we've heard tonight.